Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about an investor's perspective on startup societies. My name is Patrick Friedman, and I am a startup society investor. So startup societies, you know, when, when I got into it about 20 years ago, it was a sort of a fringe topic or a nonprofit uh, area. But now it's becoming something that's actually investable, which is which is really exciting. So I'll briefly explore kind of why that is. And then I'm going to talk about uh, kind of what we're looking for in investments and what we see as the main issues that startups face. So definitely, I come from a Silicon Valley perspective. Um, I've been living in this in the Silicon Valley area for 20 plus years. And one thing that happens here is that Silicon Valley is constantly finding sectors and improving them. You know, an example is transportation being improved by Uber or the smartphone changing how we communicate or edu education and Khan Academy. So kind of we're always looking here for industries or sectors where people are unhappy, things aren't being done in a great way, the, the product is not good and, uh, and there's an opportunity to build a better product and make, make improve people's lives. So I, you know, as those who've followed my work know, I tend to look at governance as an industry and kind of focus on it from this business perspective with the idea that uh, governance is like a product that is offered by countries or regions or cities and the operators of those regions to citizens, um, you know, in return for fees and taxes. So one thing that, that we see is that there's a, a complex of industries that where people are pretty unhappy. Um, and we call this the paper belt. This is an analogy of biologies to the old rust belt. And the paper belt includes governance, education, finance, and media. Um, each of these are, are old paper-based industries that a lot of people are very unhappy about where prices seem much, much higher than value. And especially in the time of COVID, especially now in the post-COVID world, we know that these paper belt fields need to get improved. Like they are not serving us. So an example is finance. Finance is being democratized by crypto. And what we see with COVID is with this economic depression, we have trillion, multi-trillion dollar bailouts, some of which this time is going to individuals, which is great. Um, you know, more in some countries like Scandinavia, less in some countries like the United States. But a huge amount of these bailouts is still are still going to large companies who are have captured the regulators and people don't like it. Uh, media is being disrupted by social media and by citizen journalists. And it's especially notable in the time of COVID. The media got it wrong about whether COVID was a threat, whether it was coming. They got it wrong about wearing masks. And this is a case where bad journalism kills. Education was already a hot field for disruption. And now that so many people are studying via Zoom, uh, people who are at expensive colleges kind of wonder, whether it was worth 50,000 a year, uh, they can see kind of what the true price of the education is. But the, the missing field, the sort of the part of the paper belt that's the largest, um, and it's kind of the hardest to see how to improve is governance. And this is where startup societies come in because people are really unhappy with their governance, especially right now. Like one thing that we can see from COVID is that before a lot of us had these these ideas that uh, some states worked better than others, that maybe those differences were large, that people were kind of wrong in thinking that most developed world states had good state capacity and were working well, and that actually things have been getting much worse for decades, that uh, a lot of these developed states were kind of like quietly failing or rusting or moldering away, and that this was a problem that we needed to work on. This is why so many of us in this, this startup society's field have been working for, for a long time, for, for, uh, for years and sometimes decades, on how to upgrade governance. How do we improve it? Because we feel like it's really not working very well. It's not changing fast. It's not innovating. 
uh, and that's a big problem. And, you know, last year, I think most people might have disagreed with that. But now people can see that bad governance literally kills, that some states like the United States responded much, much worse to COVID than other countries like Taiwan, um, you know, or Sweden, that the differences in, in state capacity are very large and that they matter, that they literally kill people and wreck economies. And whether you think that this has happened because governments have overreacted or underreacted or wrongly reacted, uh, it doesn't matter. What we can see is that governance quality varies, that those differences matter. And so I think we can all come together on the idea that ways of upgrading governance are critical, are needed now more than ever. And that's where, that's where we come in. Uh, improving states saves lives, uh, whether it's during a pandemic or for any of the other numerous crises that are sure to come along. Uh, because one thing you can count on is that crises will happen. So this is where Pronomos Capital comes in. Uh, we're a, a Silicon Valley style, early stage venture capital firm. And we're trying to build better cities with better laws. Uh, and our, our basic business model is that we treat startup societies as a real estate business. So there's a lot of different approaches. And you know, a number of people uh, asked me in the last couple of days about uh, more social impact or nonprofit or community-based approaches. And I think it's great to have a diversity of ways to attack this really important problem. But the way that we fundamentally come at it is startup societies as, uh, as a real estate business. Uh, and so the basic model that we are operating under is that it's a real estate business where the value driver of the real estate is good governance, is better laws and institutions, is honest courts, is reasonably priced business licenses, is being higher on the doing business index, all of that. So the basic model, it's, it's similar to real estate development <clears throat> that's based on rezoning, as some real estate development is, except here the rezoning is kind of much more novel and ambitious. The idea is that a company works with a government to create legislation to designate a certain region that has different laws, different institutions, not completely, but to some degree, from the rest of the country, and where... Uh, where we as the investors, where the government and where the operator uh, all believe that these changes in the laws will lead to generating economic activity, will lead to creating value, to giving people jobs where they earn more than they would otherwise. And so the company uh, gets the land, they get this governance concession to operate this land that's been rezoned for different laws. And then they operate like a real estate developer, bringing in tenants for commercial, residents for the residential. And they then capture a share of the GDP that they create, either through taxes, which are taxes, just are capturing a share of GDP, um, or through leases or leases capitalized into land value. Uh, and so that's the basic model. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, I started the sea standing movement back in... Well, we, we started the nonprofit in 2008. I started working on it in 2002. Uh, I'm an engineer who spent 10 years at Google doing software, started the ephemeral festival, uh, and I'm a husband and father of three who lives in a self-sufficient house in the mountains uh, above the Bay Area. The investors of Pronomos Capital include Peter Thiel, who's our anchor, Mark Andreessen, who wrote that fabulous recent essay on how it is time to build. Uh, Balaji, who you saw spoke earlier, Roger, who you saw speak earlier, and Roger's business partner, Olivia Janssens. And we have a number of great investors, some of whom spoke here, like Tavi Kotka and Tom Bell. So one of the most frequent questions that we get asked is, what are we looking for? So as an investment fund, we're looking for a for-profit corporation that has a team of full-time founders who are going to work to rezone land with better laws, have some plausible business model for what industries will attract, uh, a, a set of legal changes that's realistic to work with the government, industries that kind of make sense uh, with the skills of the people. The areas of experience that we're most looking for are in entrepreneurship, because at the beginning, this is a startup. In real estate, 
because while this starts out as kind of a risky startup, what it turns into is a real estate business where you are improving land and leasing it out. And then the third key experience is connections to the region in which you'll be operating. Uh, this is really important. Those who joined the VIP Investor Roundtable got to hear this from, from Eric Brimmon. Uh, it's just, it's critical that the, the founders of, of a company be connected to the local area in which they're working, uh, that they either some of the founders themselves or their advisors or close business partners are from the area because it's, it's just critical for a, a startup society to succeed, that it be, uh, that pull and push be balanced. And here, push means go into a country and trying to convince them that they want something. And pull means the country saying, please do this project here. And there's just all kinds of, of bad kind of messy things that happen um, when working with a country, just like, I don't know, when, when, when working in life or with friends or with relationships or, or with customers or anything else, when you're having to convince them, it's, it's probably not going to work for a long-term close relationship. Whereas if, if they want you and are eager to work with you, then it's a good idea. Some of the things that we kind of will do an automatic uh, pass on is if nobody is working full time. So at the earliest stage, sometimes these projects are handled by uh, by consultants who are doing the earliest stage work. And, you know, that's that's very natural, but we're not going to invest at that stage until there's a full time founding team. We share kind of the the Silicon Valley vision, which says that that the founding team is the most critical thing about a business. Uh, like there has to be a legal entity. It has to be properly structured and incorporated in a reasonable jurisdiction that we understand. It has to be for profit because, you know, our model is to invest money in these projects and return more money to our investors. Uh, you know, and, and I think that it's absolutely critical, this idea of, uh, of, of for profit, because like in order to re, like rezone and rebuild large parts of the world for millions of people, like that's going to take billions, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars. And the only way to get that kind of money is to make a profit. So, you know, if we're going to like rezone the world and build better cities with better laws, uh, we have to do so at a profit. It's the only way to fund the, the massive, massive investment in building that it takes. Um, when we evaluate a project, uh, the main way that we look at how much we value it, how much money we'll put in, what stage we consider it is traction. Uh, and as examples, the pre-seed stage, which is where we see uh, the companies that are going to enter our accelerator that we're working on, is a strong founding team and maybe a little bit of traction in the sense that a country has expressed interest. Maybe you've started talking to them about the details. Maybe you have an anchor tenant who's beginning to express interest. And then the seed stage that, that you would ideally get to when you finish our accelerator program or that some uh, companies like Blue Book Cities that we invested in um, are at independently is to have significant traction with a country, like you're working closely together on a program. Uh, perhaps they've signed a, an MOU, a non-binding agreement to work together. Uh, you may have LOIs, letters of interest from tenants, meaning they said, okay, if you build this, then we'll lease it. And then uh, the Series A is what we categorize as the next round. That's the first build. That's a project that is uh, fully approved. Maybe there's a little bit of I's to dot and T's to cross, um, but it's, it's fully approved by the country. Uh, you have the governance concession. You probably have land options already. And what you're going to do with this Series A money is to buy the land and do your first build. And then later, the stage that we hope that lots of startup societies get to, uh, Series B, C, et cetera, are the expansion builds. So the Series A first build, maybe it's an office building, or maybe it's residences for 100. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a small cruise ship uh, that 500 people are going to live on. Um, that's the first build. And we expect that to cost millions or low tens of millions. And then in the later rounds, okay, maybe your project is succeeding. Uh, it's profitable. People love it. They're interested. You've got people clamoring to, to live there and businesses that want to want to locate there. And now you might raise tens or hundreds of millions to do an expansion build. I'd say one of the biggest um, 
issues is the this the chicken and egg that you have in this multi-party situation so there's the founders have to deal with the partner country with the investors with the potential tenants and the citizens and every one of them as in any business is going to be like yeah i, I don't want to join until the other ones are solid so the country doesn't want to uh bother to invest their political capital and passing legislation unless you've got investors who are ready or tenants who are assigned. The citizens don't want to think about moving there if they think you're not even going to build it because you don't have investment. Uh, the tenants don't want to allocate people to specking out a new manufacturing facility or R&D lab that they're going to put in your startup society uh, if they think that the government will never approve it. And so a lot of what is needed from the founders is just kind of incrementally pushing as much as you can on each of these and just advancing one and using that traction to advance the other one and using that traction to uh, advance the first one and so forth. Uh, you know, that's very much in the nature of this. And that's why kind of the, the biggest, you know, most important thing that I, that I think needs is a founder who has a lot of grit and dedication, like a, a team who just is, is gonna move things forward no matter what. And if things are stuck, they find a way to get them unstuck. Uh, and that's, that's what I think it takes to do a startup society.